Welcome everyone to the College of Science virtual seminar for this beautiful July Friday afternoon. Um, one month to the semester begins, which is kind of hard to believe. It's, uh, it's coming up rather soon. Um, glad that people could join us today. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Gita McDonald, um, who is located um, in our marine science program down at Moss Landing Marine Labs. Um, Gita uh, is a California native who uh, did her undergraduate work at UC Santa Cruz, uh, then ran up to Sonoma State University for a master's degree, um, looking at uh, some uh, of the biology of elephant seals. Uh, she then came back to UC Santa Cruz where she got her PhD uh, and started studying uh, energetics in Antarctic animals. Uh, did a postdoc at the Scripps Institution and a postdoc at uh, Aarhus University in uh, Copenhagen, yeah? Did I get that uh, right? In Aarhus, so. Uh, yeah, in Ar I'm sorry, in uh, Denmark, right? Yeah, in Denmark, yeah. Yeah, um, and then since uh, 2015 has been at the Moss Landing Marine Labs. Uh, she's been an assistant professor since starting, but she just uh, received word that she'll be promoted to associate professor with tenure uh, just about a month from now as well. The official date is right on the first day of the semester. Um, so very happy to see that news and uh, glad that she has become a permanent member of our faculty at this point. Um, today, she's gonna be telling us about her work studying um, the energetics, uh, physiology, and uh, all kinds of other details having to do with how uh, marine mammals dive. Uh, and use energy to do so. Um, and I can't wait to hear about all the details. It sounds really cool. Anything to do with marine mammals is always very popular, I'm sure. Uh, uh, so without further ado, um, we'll get started. Uh, final final uh, important point, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the, uh, in the chat box. And if you, um, if you find, uh, sorry, if uh, the question is um, relevant at that instant, I will interrupt Gita and ask her to answer the question. If it looks like something that can wait till the end of the talk, I will wait till then and let you ask your question out loud yourself. So without further ado, Gita McDonald. Hi. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. I'm always happy to talk about diving physiology. Um, you can ask my students about that. I can lecture for hours. I've done my best to cut this down to about 35 or 40 minutes, so hopefully I won't ramble on too long. Um, but before I get into kind of the meat of the talk where I talk about the diving physiology of marine mammals, I thought I would just introduce myself um, as a scientist. So I consider myself a physiological ecologist. So basically I study the physiological adaptations that animals have to their environmental conditions. And the reason I was drawn to this field is because every class I, I took as a student in biology, I loved. So it allows me to use ecology, behavior, evolution, anatomy, and physiology to address um, these physiological questions. My research area falls into two fairly broad areas. I'm interested in the diving physiology of breath hole divers. So that's marine mammals and seabirds. I'm interested in determining how long they can dive for and understanding the mechanisms that determine their dive capacity. The other area of research is energetics and these are actually quite nicely linked. Um, and I'm interested in how animals expend their energy. So how much energy do they need to ingest? And then how do they allocate this towards growth, reproduction and maintenance? I'm not really interested in studying animals just in the lab setting, although I think you can get a lot of information. I really want to understand how their physiology impacts their behavior and their ecology and their natural environments. So for example, by studying their diving physiology in their natural environments, I can determine what their physiological limitations are um, and how this might impact their foraging. The research I do with energetics allows me to address questions in optimal foraging theory and life history theory and by combining all of this, we can improve our understanding of the ecological niche of these organisms. And this is becoming more and more important because as the environment is changing and there's more stressors in the ocean environment, um, kind of having this, what are their physiological and ecological limitations can help inform how they're going to respond and if there's any way we can mitigate the response. 
So this kind of brings together, I like to apply all of this in the field of conservation physiology. So today I'm just gonna talk about diving physiology in the interest of time. And when you're talking about what is this, you know, what, what do diving physiologists do? There's two main challenges that marine mammals face and one, or physiological challenges. One is how do they deal with the lack of oxygen when they're diving? So they're just diving with one lung full of air. So how do they manage the oxygen that they take down with them? And then ideally, how do they deal with having low oxygen levels? So if they start to run out of oxygen, how do they deal with that? So what's their hypoxia tolerance? The other main challenge that they face is pressure. So many of these species dive down to great depths. The increased pressure can cause tissue damage just due to pressure, but then there's also issues with as pressure increases, so does the solubility of gases and fluids, and this can lead to some pressure-related illnesses such as decompression sickness. And so those of you guys that are divers are probably very familiar with that um, because it's actually more of a problem when you're continually breathing air on a dive. More recently, diving physiologists have started to focus on how are stressors, either human or natural, impacting their ability to manage oxygen and handle pressure. So those are sort of the three big fields of study in diving physiology. In today's talk, I'm primarily gonna focus on oxygen management and how stressors impact their ability to manage oxygen. So I'll be talking about three different species. So for oxygen management, I will be talking about how California sea lions or what we've learned about their oxygen management strategy, some work I started as a postdoc down at Scripps. Then I'll move on to some work that I'm currently working on with harbor porpoises. And then I'll also end with a current project that's in the early stages with elephant seals, investigating how their dive response is altered in response to an acoustic stressor. And as I talk about this, I will include some um, kind of future directions where this work is going. So many of you guys may know this, but marine mammals are breath hole divers. So that means that they have this challenge in that their food is found at depth, but they have to return to the surface to get air. They rely on air just like all mammals. They should behave in a way that's gonna maximize the amount of time that they can spend underwater foraging, and they can do this by diving aerobically. So about 40 years ago, Jerry Coyman coined the term the aerobic dive limit. And it's defined as the dive duration in which you start to see an increase in blood lactate. And this is important because once an animal starts to produce lactate, they have to spend longer at the surface clearing it. So Jerry Coyman took advantage of the isolator of Weddell seals in the Antarctic and created this isolated dive hole protocol where he could pick up a seal from the ice edge, take it far away from the ice edge where it only has a single hole for it to breathe in. The animal could then choose how long it wanted to dive for. So this was very different. Up to this point, most studies just threw marine mammals in a bathtub and, and took measurements. Here, the animals got to choose how long they were gonna dive, but every time they needed to get air, they had to come up to that one dive hole and he could take a blood sample. And what he found, and each one of these dots is the end of a dive, or is the blood sample at the end of a dive. So for example, this dot here is what the lactate level was at the end of a 10 minute dive. And for all of the dives that were less than 21 minutes in duration, lactate levels in the blood were no different than they were at rest. But once the Weddell seals or when the Weddell seal performed dives that was longer than 21 minutes in duration, you started to see this increase in lactate. And the longer the dive, the more lactate was produced. So he coined this inflection point, the aerobic dive limit. So as long as they, their dives were less than this, they didn't have to spend extra time at the surface clearing the lactate. And so what this means is that if they dive aerobically, they can increase their diving efficiency. So a Weddell seal can make numerous 20 minute dives right after each other, just spend a minute or two at the surface where they offload carbon dioxide, onload oxygen, um, and they can do this pretty much all day long. Um, but if they, for some reason, perform an anaerobic dive, maybe their breathing hole is blocked, they will then have to spend, like if they do a 60 minute anaerobic dive, they spend a, over an hour and a half at the surface recovering. So by diving aerobically, they can spend over 90% of their time underwater, but once they start to perform anaerobic dives, that decreases. So in the example of a 60 minute anaerobic dive, the um, dive efficiency or the amount of time they spend underwater is less than 40%. So it, it is very beneficial to dive aerobically. So marine mammals have a suite of adaptations that increase 
the duration that they can dive aerobically. So one of the things they have is they have a lot of oxygen. So as humans, or we have about 20 mils of oxygen per kilo, like that's how much we can store. If you compare that to a California sea lion, it's about two and a half times that at 52 mils of oxygen and elephant seals is almost five times higher. So they have a lot of oxygen that they store in their body. They also have mechanisms that reduce the rate at which they use this oxygen. And this is called the dive response. So the dive response consists of a diving bradycardia or a decrease in heart rate. This was originally documented in those forced immersions that I mentioned, but we have now documented it in natural dives and they can decrease their heart rate and cardiac output by up to 90%. Associated with this is peripheral vasoconstriction, because you can imagine if your heart rate decreased by 90%, if you don't have some peripheral vasoconstriction, you're going to have a rapid decrease in blood pressure and not be able to provide your brain with, with any oxygen. So associated with this decrease in heart rate, there is an associated peripheral vasoconstriction. So it's redistributing the blood. In, a lot, in the longer dives, there's often muscle isolation. And so this is really conserving the oxygen for the heart and the brain. So to help understand why this dive response is so beneficial to, man or why it's so important in oxygen management and diving animals, um, I'm gonna introduce a, an equation you guys probably were introduced to a long time ago, which is Fick's equation. And from this equation, you can calculate the metabolic rate or the oxygen consumption from cardiac output. So this is heart rate and stroke volume. And you multiply this by the difference in oxygen in the arterial and the venous systems. And to help visualize the impact of the dive response on metabolic rate based on this fixed equation, if we first focus on cardiac output. So here in this right graph, we have cardiac output here at rest, typical human, it's about five liters per minute. At rest, arterial saturation is about 99% and venous saturation is about 75%. So using these variables, you can assume that the area of this square is the metabolic rate. So this is not necessarily super mathematically accurate. I'm just um, using this visualization to kind of show how the dive response impacts metabolic rate. So now if this animal undergoes the diving bradycardia, so a decrease in heart rate, just a 50%, you can see that that's gonna decrease the metabolic rate by 50%. Now, if we look at the second part of the equation, well, typically if you're perfusing exercising muscle, you're going to actually have venous saturations that are lower. They may be close to 40%, depending on how hard you're working. So you have a much bigger arterial venous oxygen difference. And so here you can see that's how that would affect the metabolic rate here. Well, if you suddenly cut off blood flow to that exercising muscle, that's going to decrease the amount of oxygen that the animals are using on the dive. So you can see how both that peripheral vasoconstriction and the diving bradycardia are key to reducing oxygen consumption when diving. So the dive response is not only important though for oxygen management. For a long time, we didn't really think that marine mammals were susceptible to decompression sickness. We figured with only one lung full of air, they actually aren't taking that much nitrogen down with them on a dive compared to a scuba diver that's constantly breathing in more nitrogen. But we now know that they are. Some species are susceptible to decompression sickness, usually if there's been some disturbance. So there's been some mass strandings of beaked whales associated with naval sonar, and when they've done necropsies, they have noticed that there are some bubbles, and when they've investigated what type of gas that was, it is nitrogen. So it does suggest that if these animals, their behavior is altered for some reason, may be susceptible to decompression sickness. But just based on the behavior that we've observed, it's hard to understand why. And modeling, so I've worked with some modelers that have identified that kind of the key facts or the key factors that determine the risk of decompression sickness are the same factors that are important in oxygen management. Things like blood flow and distribution, because not only is that blood taking oxygen to the tissues, it is also taking nitrogen that could be absorbed. Other things that are important are lung volume, so how much air do they take with them on a dive. This is important for both oxygen and how much nitrogen they're going to absorb, and the depth of lung collapse. So many species dive deep enough that their avioli, or where the gas exchange part of their lung, collapse, and so they don't exchange gases anymore. But we don't have this information for a lot of animals. Um, in 2017, because we have started to observe that there was decompression sickness in some mam mammals, 
the Office of Naval Research uh, supported a workshop on diving physiology where we got a lot of experts together, gave a lot of presentations, and then we identified what are some of the key knowledge gaps that we need to understand. Not only to understand how, like, what the physiological limits are of marine mammals, but why some species are more at risk to decompression sickness. And what we came up with, the top four, where we really need to improve our understanding of what is the relationship between heart rate, blood flow, and blood distribution in naturally diving animals. These relationships have only been looked at in those forced immersions. Um, we've only measured heart rate in freely ranging animals. We also are starting to learn more about what controls or what influences the dive response, but now we want to know more about, well, what about noise? The ocean is a noisy place. How is noise potentially going to impact their dive response? And we also identified that we need to know a lot more about what is their actual diving lung volume? How much air are they taking with them? How much perfusion is the lung getting during the dive? And at what depth does the lung collapse? Because these are all factors that are going to influence both oxygen and nitrogen absorption. And to do all of this, we need to improve tag technology. Um, and so what you'll see in today's talk is that my research program is really trying to address all of these. And I won't talk about all of them today, but um, I've really kind of focused my diving physiology work to try to address some of these knowledge gaps. So the first project that I'm gonna talk about is a project I started as a postdoc at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, where we um, measured heart rate blood oxygen and behavior in wild California sea lions in order to understand how they're managing oxygen and what the role of um, lung oxygen stores were and how much oxygen is being delivered to the tissues. California sea lions are a model organism, model species for these diving physiology studies because they have a range of behaviors. So most of their dives are less than three minutes. So within their aerobic capacity, but they do occasionally perform long dives, as you'll see in some of the upcoming data, the longest being about 13 minutes. Because they are relatively well studied, we also know how much oxygen they can store per kilo. And because their um, studies have been done in captivity, we have estimates of their diving metabolic rate. So we can estimate what their aerobic dive limit is. And that's called the calculated aerobic dive limit. So it's, they should be able to dive aerobically for about three to five minutes. So in the first study, we wanted to investigate that first variable in the Fix equation. So how are California sea lions regulating their heart rate or heart, yeah, their heart rate when they're diving at sea? So we did have some predictions based on data from other species. We did predict that they would exhibit a bradycardia, that they would decrease their heart rate in every dive and that the degree of bradycardia would depend on what they were doing during the dive. So in longer dives, they would have lower heart rates. And then we also predicted their behavior or their activity in the dive would influence it. So we predicted that the lowest heart rate would actually be at the end of descent. So we know that a lot of marine mammals use very energy efficient swimming strategies. So California sea lions become negatively buoyant and drift down to depth. So at the end of descent, they some, many of the animals have not been stroking for a while, so we predicted this would be the lowest heart rate. So in order to do this, we went out to San Nicolas Island and we captured five lactating female California sea lions. We target lactating females because that means we can get our data loggers back. So we can catch them on the beach, instrument them, let them go, they go out to sea and forage for, for a few days, and then they're gonna come back and feed their pup. And when they come back, we can recapture them and get our data loggers. So this is an animal that's instrumented with our data logger. So here we have the heart rate logger. So we actually got the raw uh, cardiogram and then we could go and identify the heartbeats. The animal was also instrumented with a time depth recorder and an accelerometer. So we knew how deep it was diving and how hard it was working. So kind of what its activity level was. And then we had a radio transmitter. So when it returned to the beach, we could actually find it again. If we combine the data from the five sea lions, we had data for almost 500 dives. Um, this is an example of the combined data for all of the one to two minute dives from the five sea lions. You can see here that the animal did exhibit a diving bradycardia. So the surface heart rate was initially around 100, dropped down to below resting values at a 50, and then started to increase. And this was consistent among all of the sea lions. And if we look at all of the other dive durations, as we predicted, the longer the dive, the more 
severe the bradycardia. And then dives that were greater than seven minutes, heart rates would get below 10 beats per minute and stay that low. So this is just part of their normal routine um, that they can decrease their cardiac output by 90% in those long dives. One of the things we were not expecting is if we actually zoom in to just that first minute of the dive, we can see that their starting heart rate is also higher or varies depending on what their dive duration is going to be. So in all of the dives that were greater than four minutes in duration, they start off with much higher heart rates, around 140, compared to the shorter dives. This indicates that they actually are planning. They know they're going to do a long dive. This isn't actually that they just did a long dive and had a super high heart rate afterwards. They actually increased their heart rate right before these long dives. So that's going to allow them to really maximize loading of oxygen before they start their dive. And then this higher heart rate in the initial phase also means that they will be able to use more oxygen in their, in their lungs. So it appears that these animals plan and alter their management strategy um, before, like at the, before they even start the dive. So next we wanted to look at how does their behavior during the dive influence heart rate. So for us, like if we go running, our heart rate increases. Well, these animals aren't just going and sinking down to the bottom of the ocean, they're actually swimming. So do they have an exercise response even though their heart rate is lower? Um, and this has been suggested for some species and documented in Weddell seals and some cetaceans. And if we look at the first part of the dive, so this MSA is just using that accelerometry data to come up with an activity index. You can see that the animal is initially stroking and working hard when it's positively buoyant, but then just like I mentioned before, it just um, passively sinks down. So there's not any stroking during this phase. The middle part of the dive, the animal starts to actually stroke and work harder again. Each one of these peaks is a stroke as it's pursuing prey. And then you can see once it starts the ascent, it has a faster stroke rate that as the animal gets more and more positively buoyant, the stroke rate slows down and the power of the strokes decrease. So we are able to identify kind of how hard these animals are working using this activity index. And if, so as we predicted, the animals typically did drift down, at least in those deep dives. So we anticipated the lowest heart rates would be at the end of descent. And that was actually true even in the short dives when they weren't gliding so much. So the lowest heart rates were almost always right at the end of descent. And then if they were pursuing prey or doing anything on the bottom, you started to see a slight increase. So we did find that minimum heart rate um, does increase at the end of descent. And we actually just finished some analysis, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna show, where we started to look at the relationship between activity and heart rate on a finer scale and did find that they have an exercise response. So when they are working harder, their heart rate does increase, but it depends, like the strength of that relationship depends on if it's a, a short or a long dive. So the next part of the study was to now focus on that second part of fixed equation. So now we wanted to look at what was going on with the oxygen levels in the arterial and venous system. So the aerobic dive limit I mentioned, it's a term that was coined 40 years ago. It's actually used all the time by marine mammal um, ecologists and physiologists as a way of defining like, what are the limits? What are the, the forging capacity um, of, of these animals? But there's a lot we don't know about what actually determines the aerobic dive limit. For very few species, we have data on what is the rate of decline of the oxygen stores and what is the status of the oxygen stores at, at the aerobic dive limit. The fact that there's lactate doesn't mean that they have used up all of their oxygen. It just means some tissue has resorted to anaerobic metabolism. And we really know nothing about muscle blood flow in freely diving animals. So this project focused on learning more about the rate of decline of oxygen stores and the status of blood oxygen stores at the aerobic dive limit. So we went into this with some hypotheses based on what we knew about California sea lion behavior and some preliminary or some earlier work on elephant seals. So compared to elephant seals, California sea lions are really not very impressive as divers. So we did not think that they would deplete their oxygen to the same low levels that elephant seals did. So we predicted that oxygen depletion would be incomplete, but it would be variable and it would depend on how long the dive is. So the longer the dive, the lower the oxygen level would be at the end of the dive. But we did not think that 
the um, oxygen levels would get super low. Because most of their dives are less than three minutes and well within their aerobic dive limit, we did not think that they would tolerate low oxygen levels. So again, we went out to San Nicolas Island, and this time we caught nine lactating California sea lions and instrumented them with a partial pressure of oxygen electrode. Um, so I'm gonna first talk about the venous data. So we were able to locate a vein or an artery by using an ultrasound. And once we located that, we could connect our sensor to a data logger. This was the first year of the study. It actually got a lot smaller, but this animal then had a logger that measured blood oxygen. It had a time depth recorder to measure its diving behavior and again, a radio transmitter. And this is an example of the type of data that we get from these data loggers. So the gray indicates a dive. The green is showing the depth profiles. So this is a series of dives down to about 40, 35, 40 meters. And then the orange is the saturation. So you can initially see an increase, it's not too surprising as pressure increases. So it is the solubility of gases and fluids. So that's what's causing that. But as the dive progresses, you see this decrease. And it is highly variable. So although these dives are all about the same duration, uh, minimum saturation varies from about 60 down to below 20. And you can see it might have something to do with what they're actually doing on those dives. Well, if we look at the data from all eight sea lions, each one of these dots is data from a dive. You can see that it is highly variable in their short aerobic dives. Um, and that individuals do, their data does seem to cluster a little bit together. But in general, when they're doing these short dives, the minimum saturation is likely influenced not just by dive duration, but how active they are on these dives. But when we get into these longer dives, only a few animals perform dives greater than five minutes, you can see that they're actually depleting their venous saturation to very low levels. So we wanted to look at some of these dives a little closer. And so um, this is a profile from a, I think this was a seven minute dive. And we saw some surprising things. Um, so one of the first things we noticed is I mentioned earlier that at rest, kind of the highest your venous saturation typically is, is 75%. So at rest, when you're not using your muscles, um, and that was also the case for California sea lions. So sleeping on the beach before their short dives, venous sat saturation was typically around 75%. But before these long dives, they were increasing their venous saturation. To us, this suggests that they're using arterial venous shunts. So they're shunting the highly oxygenated arterial blood directly into the venous system using these shunts in order to maximize the amount of oxygen they take with them on a dive. So we thought we knew how much oxygen they could take with them on the dive, but if their satur venous saturation is actually 90%, and that's two thirds of their blood volume, they're taking down a lot more oxygen than we had thought. And again, they only do this in these long dives, suggesting that they plan. They know they're gonna do a long dive and they're really loading up on oxygen. We know that these shunts exist. They've been documented in necropsies. It was always thought that they were important for thermoregulation, but now we're starting to think that they might also be important for diving. The other thing that we noticed that was a little bit surprising to us, was not apparent in the elephant seal data, was that at the end of the dive, we started to see this increase in saturation. And it puzzled us for a while, and we started to think about what could be causing this. <clears throat> and we realized that as the animals dove, their lungs collapsed. And as they started to surface again, if their lung re-expanded and there was any oxygen left in their lungs, they could potentially tap into this. And to really address this, we needed to get some arterial data. That proved very challenging. I will say we probably tried on 10 different sea lions, um, finally got an arterial line in one sea lion, Luckily, she did a lot of dives, and so we have a lot of data from that one animal. And so we finally started, uh, we, we got an insight into what was going on in, in the arterial system. This is, an, again, a profile very similar to the venous. Um, this animal primarily did these short, shallow dives, about two minutes in duration, and then would occasionally have a deeper dive. So this is about a five-minute dive down to 200 meters. In these dives, saturation typically fluctuated in this example between about 80 and 95, but it often, um, kind of in the entire record, would often fluctuate between 60 and, and 95. But when they did these occasional deep dives, the saturations would get down quite low. So arterial saturation is down to about 40%. And to give you some perspective, that's pretty much the lowest that's ever been measured in a human that's lived to tell the tale. 
um, at the top of Mount Everest. So just in this routine dive, saturations were getting quite low. And if we look at all of her data, <clears throat> so this is just one sea lion, but we have thousands of a thousand dives from her. Again, you can see that in these dives, most of her dives were less than three minutes. It was variable, but most of the minimum saturations were between 65 and 95. But when she did these occasional longer and deeper dives, saturation sometimes got very low, specifically in three dives. These are some of the lowest saturation values ever measured. Again, an animal that's lived to tell the tale. It's similar um, to what was observed in forced submersions and also similar to what was observed in elephant seals. So even though it's not very common, they can tolerate very low levels of oxygen. In addition to these shallow dives, this sea lion also did a single bout of serial deep dives. So for about 50 dives, she made all of her dives were greater than five minutes and she dove down to depths of 200 meters. And during this bout of deep dives, not that kind of that occasional one mixed in, it was very clear that she was managing her oxygen differently because oxygen saturations did not get very low. And if we compare the profiles, you can even see that the profiles are very different. So on the left is the profile I showed you before. This was that occasional deep dive where saturation got low. Well, in the serial bout of deep dives, the shape is even different. And so if we zoom in and look at that shape a little more, what we think is going on, we see this initial increase in saturation, which totally makes sense. They're diving, pressure is increasing, solubility is um, increasing. But then we see this small but rapid decrease in saturation. And then we see this rapid increase at the end. And we think this is evidence of lung collapse and re-expansion. And so in these deep dives, their lungs are collapsing. They have extreme bradycardia, so they're not depleting the oxygen to very low levels. And then there's a little bit of oxygen left in the lungs when they start to surface and they're able to tap into this. And it's not until the end of the dive that their levels start to decrease. This was the first time that this had been observed. Um, so we're pretty excited about it. And we can also use this information to estimate the depth of lung collapse. So for seals, it was often thought that, um, like for elephant seals, lung collapse happens at much shallower depths, but in these California sea lions, they're actually taking a lot of air down with them on a dive in their lungs and their lungs aren't collapsing until about 200 meters. So to kind of wrap up what we've learned from California sea lions, it seems like they're actually able to prepare for long dives. They had an anticipatory increase in heart rate and venous oxygen saturation before the long dives. Um, so they're, they manage oxygen differently when they know they're gonna be doing a deep dive. They also are capable of extreme bradycardia. We saw some extreme levels similar to what had been observed in forced immersions. And again, they can tolerate very low levels of oxygen. And compared to other marine mammals that have been studied, a lot of times we always said marine mammal, like lung oxygen is not necessarily that important, their lungs collapse. For California sea lions, that lung oxygen store is likely important, and it's something that they can tap into towards the end of their dive when their blood oxygen um, or muscle oxygen is likely depleted. So now I'm going to switch um, <clears throat> and talk a little bit about some work that I've been doing with harbor porpoises. So most of what we know about diving physiology is from the seals and the sea lions. And that's because we can glue things to them, we can capture them on land, we can put sensors in them. That's a lot more challenging with the cetacean, so we know much less. Um, there's been very few studies on the physiology of wild cetaceans or the diving physiology. And so as part of my postdoc, we started to work on developing a tag that we could deploy on wild cetaceans. And so I'm just gonna talk about some of the results we have from porpoises that inform us how porpoises are managing oxygen during routine foraging and transit dives. So in order to do this, we needed to develop some new tag technology. So I worked with Mark Johnson to modify his D tag, which already measured sound, acceleration, and depth, to also incorporate an um, echocardiogram sensor. And so this was the prototype tag that we tested in the lab. So it did get smaller. Um, and these are the suction cup electrodes. So we put an electrode on each side in order to get a clear heart rate. And because these tags also measure depth, sound, and acceleration, we could look at how things like dive duration and depth, activity, and feeding, because porpoises make a buzz every time they're attempting to eat some prey, we can look at how all of these variables influence heart rate. And this, was, this is actually the first time that this has been done in more than a single animal um, in cetaceans. 
This is an example of some of the data that we can get from these tags. So this is an 11 hour record from a, an adult female porpoise. That top panel is showing the dive record. So porpoises don't dive very deep. Um, because of the buzzing, we can actually identify on what dives there was foraging. So the red indicates a foraging dive. And just even looking at it at this kind of zoomed out view, you can see that during the foraging dives, this middle panel is activity, that they are working harder during foraging dives. And this results in a higher respiration rate. So when they're foraging, they're working harder, they're breathing more. And then we looked at their heart rate and we can see that the dive heart rate doesn't actually seem to change that much, but after a for an active foraging dive, their surface heart rate is higher. And you can really see this if you start to zoom in. So this panel here is an example of non-forging dives. Even though there is a range of dive durations, the, basically the dive heart rate is stable. This, was, this is actually really unusual compared to most of the data that we have where dive duration has a big influence on dive heart rate. And the other thing that was really surprising is that in these forging dives, they're a lot more active. So this is that activity index. But again, the bottom heart rate is pretty consistent. So at least in these Danish porpoises, they seem to have a very constant dive heart rate and what they seem to modulate or change is that surface heart rate. And this is just data from one porpoise. So to show you that it's just not me cherry picking, we were able to instrument four porpoises, two adults, so an adult female and adult male and three juvenile males. And you can actually see that almost all of these porpoises d almost doubled their activity during the foraging dives. So the foraging dives are the red. But when we look at their dive heart rate, there really is no difference. So despite the fact that they're twice as active in those foraging dives, heart rate is staying constant. But if you look at the surface heart rate, that's where you start to see they're making up for that. So they're maintaining this kind of moderate, consistent heart rate during these dives. And then they're increasing their heart rate at the surface if it was a higher activity dive. Again, this is different than what has been documented in pretty much any other marine mammal whose heart rate has been measured. And one of the reasons that we think this is, is that porpoises, they've been proposed to live in the fast lane. They're a small animal that lives in relatively cold water. They have high metabolic rates, resulting in high feeding rates. Um, specifically, the porpoises in Denmark are feeding about 70% of the time on very small prey. So we think that they might need to maintain this moderate heart rate so that they can continue to digest as they're continuing to feed. So a lot of animals like stellar sea lions and gray seals, they might have a feed, like feed for a bit and then have some kind of recovery dives. And that may not be possible in these porpoises. And so instead of modulating their dive heart rate, they're keeping it at a constant level where they can meet basic metabolic or uh, metabolic maintenance demands. So we're now working on modifying this tag to put out on cetaceans that we don't have to catch. So the harbor porpoises we could handle, they're small. Um, we actually successfully deployed this on some pilot whales last year. Um, this year we were supposed to do it again. We made some modifications to try to get better data, um, but COVID-19 happened. So we'll see when we get out there to do that again. But we're trying to actually get a tag so we can at least measure heart rate on beaked whales, which seem to be one of the animals or the species that's most susceptible to decompression sickness. And then the last thing I just want to touch on is kind of that area of like how are stressors impacting their ability to manage oxygen. So like I mentioned, we're hoping to get that tag out on a beaked whale, potentially see how noise might impact their heart rate but we won't be able to measure things like blood flow um, and blood oxygen level in a beaked whale. So elephant seals are excellent models for us to try to make some of those connections. They're exceptional divers. So just like the beaked whales, they make very long, deep dives. We know they have a behavioral response to noise that's been documented before. And the best thing is, is that we can instrument them with these data loggers that measure oxygen levels and heart rate, and we can get our data loggers back. So this is an NSF project. Um, we were supposed to have our third and final field season this year also, but got canceled. So this is gonna be ex extended, um, where we're investigating how at sea experimental, or using at sea experimental disturbances to characterize the physiological plasticity of the dive response in elephant seals. And kind of to just quickly, our main goals are one, to get a comprehensive picture of dive phenotype. So today I talked to you about heart rate in California sea lions and blood oxygen in California sea lions, but they're a small animal and we can't actually measure a lot of variables all at one time. Well, the elephant seal is big enough that we can. So for the first time, 
we're going to study the fine scale behavior. So we're using data loggers where we can recreate the 3D movement of the elephant seals. And we're linking this with physiology data, heart rate, muscle oxygen, and blood oxygen. We're still in the process of developing that. We were also supposed to be testing that out this April, but that has um, also been delayed. So we're hoping to get all of these physiological variables and all of these behavioral variables, and for the first time, really get a, a clear picture of the dive phenotype. And then we're adding an acoustic stressor to see how this changes. And so we can look at short-term changes in behavior and oxygen management strategy. And we're also taking samples to look at intermediate responses using stress hormones. And I'm just gonna show some preliminary data that we have. Um, yeah, just to give you a glimpse of kind of what we're finding. So again, this is the beginning of a depth profile. So this elephant seal dove down to about 450 meters. It was instrumented with an accelerometer. I'm just showing one axis here that's a good indicator of stroking. So you can see as the animal starts to swim up, it's stroking a little bit more. We measured its heart rate. So heart rate was about 120 at the surface, rapidly decreases to about 50, and then gradually declines throughout the dive, stays below 20 for most of the bottom part of the dive. And we also measured the blood oxygen. Again, just like the sea lions, we see that initial increase, and then we see a gradual decrease throughout. Again, this little blip here, like in the sea lions, but it starts to decrease again. Well, then we expose these animals to a stressor. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it. Um, but we expose them to 20 seconds of killer whale vocalizations. And what we saw is that they aborted their surfacing. So this is gonna extend their dive. So they basically went back down another 100 meters in depth before starting their ascent again. And what we saw, this wasn't them actively, like rapidly swimming away. It was actually they stopped swimming and sank down. Their heart rate dropped from 40 beats per minute down to three beats per minute almost instantaneously. And associated with this really low heart rate, you can see that the blood oxygen depletion flatlined, which indicates that when their heart rate got that low, the muscle was isolated and they were not perfusing the tissues. And so we're hoping to get more of this data, start to see like, you know, do, do they respond differently to different sounds? Do they respond differently um, in different parts of the dive and get a better understanding of how plastic this dive phenotype is and look at the energetic consequences of disturbance on these animals. So this study is helping or is improving our understanding of the dive capacity of elephant seals and how plastic the response is. It's improving our understanding of the mechanisms that are underlying the dive response. So we know that exercise can have some influence, but we also have some evidence that volition does, that these animals can plan things. And so how does a stressor impact that? And this is the first study where we're really getting this, or we're hoping if we can get the blood, uh, the muscle oxygen sensor to work reliably, to link behavior, heart rate, and, and blood flow to the muscle um, together. And this is, one, this is one of the few species where we can collect this kind of data. And so if we start to understand the links between behavior, heart rate, and blood flow, we're hoping to apply this data to animals like the beaked whale. So if we can get heart rate from a beaked whale and behavior, get a better understanding of why is the species at risk. And I'll end with that. Um, and this is just an acknowledgement slide of kind of the funding and the different people I've worked with on these projects. And I am open to questions. Hopefully I didn't ramble too long. Thanks, Gita. That was really cool. I'm going to um, open up the questions uh, with, uh, I don't know, maybe two, two things that I, I wanted to ask. So the first is, you were talking about the difference between foraging dives and non-foraging dives in the, um, in the seals, right? Um, uh, in the porpoises, we can sorry. identify that. Sorry, in the porpoises. So, um, is there a reason for the non-foraging dives? I'm trying to understand why this behavior even exists. Um, it's just how they move. It's actually more efficient to move underwater than it is to okay. swim along the surface. So mm -hmm. if they're not foraging, they're still usually moving somewhere or um, spending time underwater. So most cetaceans don't spend a lot of, like they don't float at the surface very often. So it's just, if they're not foraging, then they're just transiting or, or moving around. And if they're moving to the foraging behavior, then when they get to the surface, they're loading up, right? They're Yeah, they're really trying to, well, and 
And that's one of the things we're looking at. They sometimes actually spend less time at the surface because I think they know they want to get back down to the prey. So mm -hmm. it's really looking at that balance. Like they're really good at optimizing getting the most energy. <laughs> from the and um, the last thing I'll ask is, is there, um, you know, if you could uh, have any sensor of your choice, that you don't currently have, what, what, would, what would you like to measure about these animals? Um, one of the sensors, one of my friends has been working on and we're um, hoping she'll get it fun, funded is it would be really nice to actually get a lactate sensor or a pH sensor um, and start to understand what happens, like what's their blood chemistry when they exceed their, what we estimate to be their aerobic dive limit. Um, like for example, elephant seals, they can perform hour long dives and still only spend two minutes at the surface. So how are they doing that? So that, that would probably be one. And I have to admit, if we can get the, the muscle oxygen sensor, we tested it out in the lab on a sleeping elephant seal and it looks really promising. And so it'd be pretty exciting to get, get a better idea of like muscle blood flow during diving in these animals too. So it's, it's actually been really fun to like work with you. Like, well, it's also frustrating when you're working with new sensors, you have a lot of failure. Right. Uh, so, but it's quite exciting when it works. And um, how do the sensors get off the animals in the end? Um, we recapture them. Okay. So for both the California sea lions and the elephant seals, um, yeah, we hopefully catch them when we want. Sometimes we miss, but then we just, um, the elephant seals we can drug and just take off the instruments in the field. The California sea lions we manually restrain and just can cut off the instruments. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. I'm going to, uh, I see at least uh, one other question here. Scott Schaefer, your colleague is <laughs> on the line. Let's see if I can uh, open up his mic and let him ask his question on his own. There we go. Scott, you should, uh, you should be able to. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Okay. Uh, Gita, I, I was curious if there's been any more research into um, neuroglobin in the brain as a way to keep the brain sufficiently oxygenated. And then um, part two of the question was uh, about, you know, contracting spleen and, and using that as a reservoir and whether there's, there's, whether there's still uh, uh, research in that going on in that area and how you might measure it. Um, so the first one, I don't think too much new has been published. I know when we get fresh, uh, carcasses, we still save the brain. So I think people are still hoping to get more data on that. Um, but I don't think there's been too much new that they, they have it and it can help, but I haven't seen any new research on that and published in a while. There is some actually really cool work um, coming out of St. Andrews. Chris McKnight has been working with um, a company that makes uh, near infrared sensors for humans to measure oxygenation of the brain. And he has tested this out on gray seals and been looking at blood flow to the brain in, in diving seals in captivity. And I know that they're planning on trying to, well, we'll see COVID's happened, but I know they're planning on coming out this fall to see chest out that sensor on elephant seals. So they're, so it's not necessarily neuroglobin, but looking at blood flow in the brain using a sensor designed for humans. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you, you just wonder like how much the brain could repeat or could tolerate repeated uh, spikes or, or, you know, depredation of, of oxygen uh, on those dives. And, you know, I mean, that, that something's going on that just seems to be, you know, beyond our yeah. grasp at this point. Yeah. Well, at least for the, so one thing we think is going on with the sea lions is we're putting our sensors in the back half of their body, not the blood right. that's actually going up to their brain. Um, we can't get any arteries uh, up there that we feel are safe to do on a wild animal, right. it might be very different. So that's actually one thing that I know Paul was trying to get a drug a jugular sensor. So once I went to Denmark, he was continuing this work um, to see if the venous saturation was different in the top half of the animal. Um, and it mm. did seem like it was like, they probably are actually cutting off blood flow more to the back half of the animal and maintaining more blood flow and keeping the saturation higher um, in the front half of the animal. So it's pretty incredible what they can do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what was the second? Part? Well, it was regarding the, you know, contracting the spleen, you know, it's always been thought that they, they use that as a sort of a reservoir for red blood cells, oxygenated red blood cells. But, but I haven't seen much follow-up since Sheila's work on that in quite a while. There, 
there actually hasn't been a lot of follow-up. I think people just accept that they do that. The seals that have that um, large reservoir, um, it, in but, Weddell seals, there's evidence of it also. So when they've done blood samplers, they can see hematocrit increases during a dive. And the only reason that would happen is if a spleen contracted. So, but you wouldn't see a change. I mean, you don't see a change in, in like blood oxygen that would signal an influx of these oxygenated red blood cells going into the, the main circulation. It, well, that might be part of that initial increase. You know, like mm -hmm. it could be a combination as pressure is increasing and solubility is increasing. Um, but no, we don't see a big. Mm. Like we don't see like, oh, that's clearly that. The sea lions don't have a very big spleen, so we wouldn't necessarily see it. And in the elephant seals, if you look at their arterial profiles, you don't see, like it's not a clear signal. We just assume no. that it's happening because the spleen contracts almost immediately. So mm. it, would, it would be pretty. And we actually think that when they're at sea diving continuously, there's not enough time between dives for the spleen to relax. So we actually think when they're at sea, their spleen is just always contracted and they always have that extra... Um, those mm. extra red blood cells, but when they're on land and they don't need that, it the the spleen relaxes and that's the hematocrit drops. Hmm. Very cool. <laughs> All right, uh, the next question is from Ben Reed. Ben, uh, you should be able to talk now. Oh, okay, cool. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, I guess this is kind of nerdy, but um, how, how do you actually stick the sensors onto the animal? Like, um, actually, so, like, how do we, we actually, <laughs> so the sensors, like if we're doing the subcutaneous electrodes and stuff like that, we actually use sterile techniques to uh, place the sensors below the skin and suture and all of that. But then the actual data loggers um, are yeah. attached with marine epoxy. <laughs> Oh, okay. So it's glue. It's glue. We just glue it onto the animals. And so the great thing is like with the elephant seals, when we've been working on them for these translocations, they molt within a week or two of when we instrument them. So all of the glue is molted off with the wow. sea lions. They also molt. So it's one of those things you can glue these instruments. We do try to minimize the amount of glue we put on them, but they molt once a year. So anything we put on them will molt off. Got it. Um, and then one, one other, um, Question on, on one of the charts, it looks like the saturation went above a hundred percent. What what does that mean that it goes above? Uh, it probably well, their saturation can't get above a hundred percent, so yeah. I'm not sure which one that was. But it could have just been a spike in the data, and I just don't delete data points. But it it means that that partial pressure of oxygen was very high. So I'm not sure which one that was. Usually, if I'm using saturation, it it gets up to a hundred, but it doesn't right, usually right, get right. above. Okay. Okay. So it's probably just the sensor screwed up and I don't usually delete data points if I don't have a good reason to. Got it. It's, uh, actually, I was going to ask another uh, related question to the data loggers. Um, I couldn't tell, but it, it looked like the, um, the sampling frequency on the muscle movement was at a higher frequency than the oxygen saturation. Is that true or is that? Yes. So the... Um, We've used a lot of data logger make, you know, who makes it, but in order, so typically oxygen is measured at one second because that's gives it like, that's a relevant scale, but right. in order to get activity, we're usually like stroke rate and things like that. We're usually sampling at least 16 or 32 Hertz. Mm -hmm. um, the person that and um, heart rate, again, it depends. So the, the tags that I've been using on the elephant seals, we can sample at 50 to hundred Hertz. Mm -hmm. But the D tags, the, the person that made the D tags, because they're only going to stay on an animal for about two days, three days at most, we can use really high sampling rates. So heart rate is actually usually sampled at, I usually down sample to 250 Hertz because it's easier right. to process. Um, but we sample like 625 Hertz for depth and acceleration. So he samples at very high, those tags sample at a very high, um, right. But with the tags that we're trying to leave out longer, we have slower sampling rates in order to increase battery life. Mm -hmm. so. Cool. It uh, looks like we have a question here from Phil Heller. Let me find Phil's uh, connection to let him in. Go ahead, Phil. Unmute myself. No, we, we got you. You got me. Can you see me? 
Uh, no, I can't see you, but we can hear you. Good enough. Um, great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm embarrassed to ask this question, but I know that everybody's dying to know the answer, so I'll speak for everybody. Um, what's it take to drug an elephant seal? Uh, good drugs. <laughs> How much? What's the dosage? What dosage <laughs> makes you feel safe right next to an elephant seal? So we use telazole, um, and I can't actually remember how many, which is kind of like a ketamine Valium type mix. Um, and it's, it's like used on horses. And I can't, I, don't, I can't give the milligrams, but I know for every 100 kilo of animal, we give about one milliliter of that drug. So like when we're drugging a 350 kilo elephant seal, we give it about, yeah, 300 kilo would be three cc's. Um, it works really well. So within a few minutes, the animal's immobilized. Its eyes are still open. It's still breathing, but it can no longer move. Um, if you guess the weight wrong, because unfortunately we can't weigh these animals until they're drugged, um, we tend to, at least I tend to underestimate a little bit, although there is a, quite a, like these animals are fairly robust. As long as you don't like completely screw up, you'll usually be fine. Um, but I usually would estimate on the low side. So sometimes I have to go back in. We maintain the anesthesia with ketamine or and Valium. And so then I'll just have to set a spinal on an animal that's maybe a little more up than I like. Um, but it works, it works pretty well. Like uh, we actually have these, we have long spinal needles and we have about six feet in extension set. And you just run up and you poke the seal um, kind of in their, their swimming muscle. And you have about six feet space to kind of step back and eject the drugs and then you run out of there. But it works, like I did not create the system, but it works really well. It's been used for at least 20 years now out at Anyo. Thank you, and I'm glad it works really well. <laughs> yeah, I've had no bite so far, so. I wouldn't be worried about being bitten. I'd be worried about getting squished, but <laughs> all their story. Uh, Jim, you had your hand up, Jim Harvey. Thanks. Um, thanks, Gita. That was, that was a great talk. Um, I'm interested in the shunt uh, portion of this, um, where those shunts are, how, and if you have any sense of, is it this part of the read system or something different? And is, do, they, do you have any sense of how they control those, those shunts? I don't. So um, Bryden, like I've actually never observed them because I'm not that great at necropsies. Um, they're typically in the skin. And they've often been in area, like they tend to have a higher abundance in areas that aren't covered with fur. So um, Bryden did a lot of necropsies in elephant seals, California sea lions, and tried to look at where these shunts were located. Um, and it's typically, like in the fur seals, the shunts were primarily in areas that were not fur covered. And that's why they were always thought to be really important for being able to dump heat. Um, but I don't think, we, like no one's actually ever seen them in action, like I don't think that there's any like scans where we see how they're using them or when they're using them. All of the evidence of these shunts are are based on just doing necropsies and seeing that they're located in areas that are probably important if an animal needs to dump heat. Cool, thanks. No problem. Okay, uh, let's see. Well, let's do a let's do a call for um, one more call for questions. Does anyone have additional questions for Gita? <laughs> it looks like there are none. Um, so let's thank Gita for a great talk. Um, it makes me want to see the data and go watch the elephant seals <laughs> get anesthetized and, and all this good stuff. So, uh, oh, let me, yeah, uh, a bunch of clap claps and great jobs in the, oh, in the response. So thank you very much, Gita, for uh, taking the time to speak to us today. And uh, thank you, everybody who was able to join us. And uh, keep your eyes out for upcoming talks. I think we have one next week uh, coming up soon. So enjoy the weekend, everyone, and talk to you soon. Thanks, Gita. That was great. Yeah, oh, glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> they're, um, they're pretty complicated animals, huh? They are. And every time we think we've sort of figured out something, they seem to do something different. So, which makes it a lot more fun. Um, 
I mean, I was looking at those oxygen saturation levels and what they send you to the hospital, they send you to the hospital if your oxygen saturation goes below 95%, right? Yeah, well, that's, I have given a, a talk where I focused more on the oxygen stuff to anesthesiologists. And mm -hmm. they're always, because they're like, if you're human and you're below 90, like you're on all of the machines and, right. um, and that's fairly normal for these guys. Like, I don't think it's normal for the saturations to be as low as that eight or 10, but apparently they can tolerate it. And again, it, it may be like, we do think with the sea lions that they're probably perfusing the upper half of their body differently than their bottom half of the body, but it's right. a lot harder to get sensors in the upper heart part of their body. So. Right. Right. Um, but we'll see, but yeah, it's, it's been fun and it's been great because the tag, tag technology keeps improving. And so we can I now, I bet you were limited by um, storage capability early on. Yeah, even just between the first year and the second year of my postdoc, the company that builds the tags for us changed their data logger, their boards, and mm -hmm. it, it changed everything. Like suddenly we could sample at a higher frequency for three weeks rather than at a slow frequency for a week. And so it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it happened very quickly. So. It, even, that stuff is even influencing how we're responding um, in some of our classes to the, having to go online, right? So. Mm -hmm you know, uh, in electrical engineering or in electricity and magnetism, you can now send home, uh, you know, basically a, a, a multi-analyzer on a chip, right? Yeah. For, well, that's, for, for 10 bucks, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, so okay, that's cheaper. Cause yeah, I've been trying to think of things that I've decided not to have very much in contact. And so I think I'm gonna buy all the students heart rate loggers. Mm -hmm. So then they can actually measure, like they can measure their exercise response and they can measure mm -hmm. and then they can share their data. But I've been having to figure out like all of the labs that I did are not socially distanced. Like right. I have one spec. And so even if I did do a hybrid lab class, there's there's no way they could do the thing. So I'm like, I'm. I might do like a demo necropsy or two, but for the mm -hmm. most part, um, but I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's a company called Labster. Oh, so yeah. I'm checking, yep. have you? Yep. It looks awesome. They're supposed to be sending me a link to do a free demo, but mm -hmm. we don't have a contract with them, do we? Um, or? We don't, but the last I heard, there was some conversation about there being a CSU wide. Um, I was hoping that would. Uh, I'll, I'll keep you posted on what I hear. Um, yeah, like right now it sounds like they might be willing to give me free access this semester, mm -hmm. but it looked like it was, of all of the online things I have seen, it's the most realistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I even know that one of the, the modules that I was most interested in is like someone that's in the, like I know who he is because he's a comparative physiologist. And so I was like, mm -hmm. okay, so people I know are actually creating some of these modules. And Yeah, so. it, yeah we've come a long way and it, and it it, it's hard to imagine what this would be been like five years ago, right? Yeah. Skype yeah, like I, I have to admit, I was really dreading online teaching. Ivano has really been trying to get me to develop that online class. And I was like, well, now I have a week to learn how to teach online. <laughs> so exactly. not as intimidating anymore. Exactly. So. Yeah, I think a lot of people have, um, you know, because of the sudden switch to online, um, you know, a lot of people had resisted it for a long time or, you know, had never tried it. Um, but the reality was that our capabilities, like in our eCampus office, had come a really long way. And so when the sudden switch happened, I think people were surprised that at least the, you know, how to bring people together part was relatively easy. Yeah, no, I, I was impressed with that. Like, the, like, we had that one week's notice. My poor students, I actually gave them the lecture the next day. They didn't, I just pre-recorded and said, watch it this week. Um, yeah. But like I had never heard of Camtasia and that was just so much. So I didn't use that the first time, but the fact that I could learn that in a week and suddenly I could edit out when my dog barked or if the doorbell yeah. rang and I didn't know how to do all of that in Zoom. Yep. Um, so the fact that that was all there and there was instructions and that I could learn how to use it in a week was really, it was great. And I, like, I, I didn't know, I'd never even heard of that program. So there we go. Yep. So there's right. some positives out of this, I guess. Yep, exactly. All right. All right. I'm well, thanks again. Yeah, thank Bye. you. And uh, we'll talk soon. Yep, sounds good. Bye. Bye.